Well, good afternoon. Uh, we're two-thirds of the way there. We have a quorum. And uh, Frank uh, just called me, and he's, uh, he'll be 20 minutes late. And so we think we have plenty to talk about uh, prior to uh, him coming. So we're electing to go ahead right now. Um, welcome to all of you to this town hall forum with our two out of three legislators, a third to come from the 43rd district who will be discussing the coming 2024 legislative session with us. This forum is sponsored by the First Hill Unit of the League of Women Voters and by the Environment Committee of Horizon House. I'm Bill Roach and I'm the chair of the Environment Committee and will be the host for this afternoon's uh, forum. I also want to call attention to uh, the fact that there's a town hall buffet after this, and you're all certainly invited to join in the terrace dining room. But before we hear our legislators, I want to tell you that at the end of today's program, two residents will be at a table here, actually they're there now, in front of the other, uh, in, in front, offering specific opportunities for citizen engagement. Mary Margaret Pruitt, uh, is here to tell you about joining the League of Women Voters and Carol Roach from the Environment Committee will be welcoming sign-ups to give you the opportunity to easily express your opinion uh, before the legislature in 2024. It's a practice that we have done in the past and it's been very effective and we're hoping we can continue that this year but it would be helpful if you could sign up. I, I manage that, that piece and it's we try to make it as simple as we can in this electronic age. It's my honor to introduce uh, Senator Peterson, uh, uh, Representative Macri, and soon uh, Frank Chop, all of whom have extensive experience representing us in Olympia. We will hear from all three and then open the floor to questions. Maybe that's Frank. That was Frank. Um, he is, there is a student protest on the University Bridge that's blocking him from coming. <laughs> but he'll be here eventually. So we will continue. I mean, this is not quite like last year when we were, had an ice storm and there's only one of us here. So, but it is what it is and let's keep going. Um, uh, Senator Peterson uh, has been our senator for the last 10 years and was elected Senate Majority Floor Leader in 2021. He also serves on the Ways and Means Committee, Law and Justice, Rules and Early Learning and, uh, and K-12 Education Committees. I might add that he has four boys who attend Seattle Public Schools, so he has a real vested interest in this. He also serves as General Counsel to McK McKinstry, a, Seattle engineering firm with a focus on green building. So we'll start with uh, Senator Peterson. Wow, I was gonna try to pawn it off on Nicole to go first. <laughs> it is a delight to be back with you. Uh, I was here a month ago to talk about a different set of topics, but, um, but really happy to be back here for the legislative forum. Uh, this is one of the things that I look forward to every year. Uh, and it is a great privilege for us to have such an incredibly engaged, uh, interested group of constituents who will turn out and listen to us go on about the work that, um, that we are very passionate about doing in Olympia. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I uh, had to faint and duck for Frank today because I spent my morning at Hamilton International Middle School uh, up in Wallingford. Uh, teaching some eighth graders about the state government. Um, I had, I think, three of the U.S. history classes. And then Frank was supposed to take the fourth one, uh, and he wasn't there yet. <laughs> so <laughs> so, uh, so I talked about him for about 10 minutes, and then he showed up, and it was, it was all fine. I, I teased him a little bit because, you know, he lives at about six blocks from Hamilton. So he, so there isn't really any good excuse for being late. But now if he's having to come across the ship canal, then I guess there's a, there's a decent reason for, uh, for being late. 
So we are headed into a short session coming up. And, uh, you know, I think in many ways it's likely to be less momentous, less tumultuous than the last few sessions. Our, our operating budget has a little bit of extra money in it, but is roughly in balance. So we'll have the ability to do a few small things, but, uh, but on the one hand, we don't need to make dramatic changes to it. And on the other hand, depending on how you look at it, we can't make dramatic changes to it. Um, we are in rough balance on the capital budget, so there's a little bit of money to spend, uh, not very much. Uh, and the transportation budget is a little bit of a mess. Uh, that's going to be a topic of significant interest, particularly for us in the 43rd, because the project that is, uh, or one of the projects that is most underwater is the 520 uh, rebuild. And um, there are real questions between the House and the Senate about how to fund that, whether to fund that, whether to kick it off uh, into the future. Uh, I personally am horrified by the idea of kicking it off into the future, uh, partly because the uh, folks at WashDOT tell us that if we wait and don't get it funded now, it's going to cost a billion dollars more than the already more that it's supposed to cost. And partly because, um, you know, Nicole has had this for the last seven years, for me for the last 18 years. I have represented these poor people down in Montlake who <laughs> have been living in the middle of a construction project that it just never seems to end. So what I want desperately for them is for that project to get finished and for them to be able to resume quiet enjoyment of their uh, property. Um, so those are sort of the big budget pictures. I would say in terms of policy issues, the shadow looming over everything that we do uh, is that there are these six initiatives to the legislature that have been filed. Now, the, I think they just turned in today the signatures on a third of them. And uh, the rumor is that they have the signatures or will have the signatures on all six. So a lot of the work that we've done over the last few years is going to be up for grabs, uh, depending on you know what people had for breakfast uh, in a year from a year from now or next November, uh, and that's everything from the long-term care program that we set up to the capital gains tax uh, to the Climate Commitment Act, which is the first uh, the first set of signatures that the uh, opponents turned in. Um, it's all the one that they turned in today was about police pursuits, trying to roll back the reforms that we did there. They Tuesday they turned in one that they call the Parental Bill of Rights, which is essentially a, a way to interfere with what's going on in public schools for people who don't like the sex education curriculum or wait now never mind that the voters have already voted on that and approved it, but. Um, Anyway, so you know that's going to be sort of hanging over our heads all session, as we uh, try to do our work. Uh, you know, in part because we're making really big and important investments right now with the Climate Commitment Act, and to think that those that that funding stream might be cut off entirely is uh, very disappointing, given what we are facing as a world uh, in terms of carbon and the leadership role that Washington State has been playing uh, for a lot of other jurisdictions uh, in terms of trying to point a way to a world that doesn't get engulfed in flames and floods. Um, so anyway, uh, there is also, and I'll let my seatmates who are the, the experts in the legislature uh, among all 447 of us on housing issues talk about the, the urgent crisis that we face in that way. Uh, but that will be, I, you know, some people called 2023 the year of housing in the legislature. I think that 2024 is likely to be an extension of that because we can see all around us the, um, the tragedy of unsheltered homelessness and all of the side effects that come from that when people don't have their basic human needs met. Uh, so we'll be trying to, um, trying to continue that work. Uh, I will say, uh, let's see, is there anything super exciting? that I, one, one more piece that I guess just for your awareness, this probably isn't, a, um, probably isn't 
a matter that is super interesting to most people outside of the legislature, but just have some compassion on us. We are likely to be twisted up in some amounts of knots because two years ago we authorized uh, legislative employees to collectively bargain. And this year we need, we commissioned a study to figure out how to make that happen. And this year that report that we commissioned has been delivered back to us and uh, the Republicans who didn't want this to happen at all will be sitting gleefully watching us argue amongst ourselves and see if we can come up with a majority for the um, for the policies that will allow that to happen. Um, I personally think it's great. There's no reason why the legislative employees shouldn't be able to band together and come to work with us. I work outside of the legislature in a business that has roughly 1,500 represented employees, and it, it, we have fantastic relationships with our, uh, with our union partners, um, and it, it helps, it really helps everybody, uh, I think, to have a, a high agreed on floor for how we relate to our employees. Um, but it, I think it's also the case that it's almost always rocky for employers to get that started. And um, so we're going to have a lot of discussion. So just because there are some very complicated issues about who should be in the bargaining unit. Uh, uh, the partisan staff are the ones who are the main agitators for uh, collective bargaining. But what do you do with the nonpartisan folks? So they, in the surveys, didn't want to be represented. They didn't even want to have the option, partly because they are very fearful that however they choose, whether they choose to be represented or choose not to be represented, it's going to be held against them as a partisan thing by uh, legislators of one party or the other. So um, anyway, that's, that's going to be a complicated set of issues for us to deal with as well. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole, but I uh, really look forward to your questions and to the conversation. Uh, I always find it very stimulating to hear what is on the minds of people who um, are very engaged in these issues. Thank you very much. Well, Representative, we're lucky to have uh, Representative Nicole Macri to represent us since 2016. She serves as the vice chair of the Appropriations Committee and also serves on the Health Care and Wellness Committee and is the co-chair of the LBGTQ Caucus. She also serves as the deputy director of the Downtown Emergency Service Center. So she is well grounded in the work that she's, uh, that she's in in the legislature. So, Representative Nicole. Thanks so much, Bill. And hi, everyone. It's great to be here. We always know legislative session is coming up when we get that uh, call from Horizon House about coming by to do uh, a little forum and preview for session. Um, Jamie covered um, a good, I think, a really great overview of what we're heading into. You know, it's interesting because the last five years, um, in a lot of ways, have been unusual. Um, Democrats uh, retook the majority in the Senate in 2018, and um, we got to work really quickly in um, enacting lots of things that folks here and folks in our district care a lot about. Um, and uh, we're seeing a little bit of that, I think, backlash reaction with these initiatives that, that Jamie men mentioned, um, that we have done a lot of good things for the people of Washington um, with Democrats in control of both chambers and the governor's office. And um, without the ability to get those electoral um, wins to get um, more conservative, conservative representation in the legislature, um, some very small group of folks are exploiting our initiative process um, in order to um, pay folks to collect those signatures. That is what the process is. What we've seen in recent years um, is that it really is a 
an endeavor in fundraising. So you, if you raise enough money, you can hire the signature gatherers to get those initiatives on the ballot. In the last few years with the pandemic, we hadn't really seen a lot. It was really the first time in Washington state history where we hadn't really seen a lot of statewide initiatives on the ballot. Um, and we may see a good number of them um, this, this coming election. So that'll be interesting. Um, I want to echo what Jamie says. We anticipate this will be a bit more subdued session than these last five years, um, especially coming out of the pandemic. Um, we received, we were fortunate, as all states were, to receive um, significant COVID relief dollars um, from the federal government um, in 2021 and 2022. Um, and so we saw really significant activity in increasing state investments um, to ensure stability across the state. Um, and we were fortunate last year as the Washington economy remains strong to be able to make a number of, of excellent investments in our public schools and higher education um, and in our workforce, both our public um, employees, but in all of our helping professions. We knew that our long-term care systems, our hospital workers, our teachers, child care workers, um, our behavioral health workers were all um, struggling, and we were able to make investments um, in, in, in stabilizing the workforce in, in all of those sectors. Um, and uh, with the passage of the Climate Commitment Act a couple of years ago, we were able to make those first investments, appropriate those dollars as those auctions for those um, carbon credits were going on. So we were able to make very sizable investments in climate resiliency across the state. Um, going into this session, as Jamie said, we are, uh, we are, it's really a tune-up year. The, the budget is kind of in a steady state. It's a biennial budget, a two-year budget. So we're really, we call it a supplemental um, year. And so we'll make some minor adjustments. I think our intent is going to be to stay the course on the investments we've already made. Um, the governor's gov uh, budget proposal came out yesterday. Um, and I think his priorities are fairly aligned with Democrats in the, both the House and the Senate. He has really prioritized um, housing and homelessness, behavioral health, and continued investment in, in climate action across the state. And uh, we will likely follow his lead. I'm sure there will be some variations from that we never pass exactly what the governor sends us, but I anticipate we'll probably move along the similar themes um, in the tone he has set for us. Uh, on the policy front, uh, Jamie talked about a number of the areas uh, that we'll likely be paying attention to. On the housing uh, front, um, I, we did last year a lot of bills around building our supply of housing. So how do we, how does the state play a role in encouraging local governments um, to get out of the way so we can just build more housing? Um, and it's not as much of an issue here in Seattle where we have seen a lot of development, um, but certainly in other areas of the state, um, really encouraging a diversity of kinds of housing so more kind of smaller cottages or fourplexes or duplexes in areas that historically have only had single family homes. Um, that's great. That will help us build uh, more supply of housing. We know we have more demand for housing. We know the Washington state population just tipped over 8 million people um, in recent months. And so we need more housing. Um, for folks, but it's going to take a while to build that. So this session, I think, will continue um, on the housing front in a number of ways. Um, I have, for many years, been working on what we do about the rapid escalation of rents in our communities, and we'll continue to work on um, rent stabilization policy, trying to figure out what's that way we um, can... Um, you know, reasonably um, avoid kind of exploitative rent increases without um, inducing 
really the sort of negative consequences that we've seen in some older style rent control, rent stabilization policies around the country. So we've been working for the last couple of years on policy to do that, and we'll continue to work on that. And um, we will continue to invest in the building of housing, the construction of housing, particularly for people who are experiencing homelessness, for people who are disabled. Um, and um, more and more, the state has become a partner with local governments and community organizations, and also ensuring that we can operate that housing that we build. And so I actually, earlier today, was in a number of different conversations about, okay, well, we, put, we invested $400 million in building additional housing in our last session. Okay, when that housing opens, how are we going to operate it? Um, because the people who are going to be moving in are not going to be able to pay rents that are adequate enough to keep the lights on, keep the water running, et cetera. So um, that is a new, newer challenge in recent years, um, and we are continuing to, to work on that. On the behavioral health front, which is an area that I do a lot of work on, um, one of the bigger investments the governor put in his budget, which we were expecting, um, is related to the closure of one of the larger um, behavioral health hospitals in King County in Tukwila. Um, the operator of the Cascade Behavioral Health Hospital um, closed down operation. And the state um, worked quickly to purchase that property. And so um, they, the governor did that after we got out of session last year. So they'll, we'll be working to make sure that we can um, fully fund the purchase of that building as well as some significant renovations that need to happen. Um, already, uh, the Department of Social and Human Services um, has stood up services in that hospital that had been shuttered. Um, and I think we have about 54 patients um, who are there now, and we're gonna continue to sort of ramp up the usage of that. And we also anticipate in the middle of 2024, the University of Washington Behavioral Health Teaching Hospital will be open. This is a project many years in the coming, actually, Representative Chop um, has really been the champion for this vision, not only to provide more behavioral health care for people um, who desperately need it, but to provide to create first in the nation institution where we can do world-class training of our next generation of behavioral health providers, everything from psychiatrists um, to behavioral health assistants, social workers, et cetera. So that is really, really exciting. We've been working on this project for many years and we will, I think, feel it here in this region, especially when we have this additional capacity and as we start to see um, professionals um, being able to increase the rate in which we're training professionals in this field. Um, so those are a couple of areas. I know uh, you all have questions about uh, sp other specific areas. I can go on and on about health policy, but I'll sort of hold my tongue for now and see where the conversation takes us. All right. Thanks. Uh, we will go to questions and then, of course, stop uh, when Frank gets here uh, to hear from Frank. But in the meantime, uh, we have some mic runners who are uh, available. And so uh, we'd like to uh, have them look for any questions that you might have. Senator, I have a question on the initiative that you were, were talking about. No, I, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, on the climate commitment initiative, the editorial in the Seattle Times suggested it needs reform or it's going to be approved by the voters. Are there reforms that you would support or that we could expect? Do you think that we need a legislative or alternative on the ballot at the same time. Thank you. Uh, so this is very complicated. Part of the problem is that we don't 
know yet what we can do, what the line is. Um, you're talking about a purposeful alternative on the ballot. We don't know what the line is yet for us to be able to reform the Climate Commitment Act without creating an alternative that will get forced onto the ballot. So it seems obvious to me, it, you know, just speaking for myself as a lawyer, not speaking for the state, that if we, we have some unexpected revenues from the Climate Commitment Act, if we appropriate those, that isn't going to be considered an alternative. On the other hand, there's a lot of uh, question about whether if we link up our market with California and Quebec, have we created an alternative then that would go in front of the voters so that they would choose one or the other. And um, if that is the case, then I think you can make the case that almost anything that we do with to change the to change the Climate Commitment Act could potentially be an alternative. There's a 1971 uh, Attorney General opinion by Slade Gorton that suggests that that is the case. And now we've not had that tested by the courts. But um, so there's that. I, I think there's a, you know, there was one, when it looked like there might be just the one initiative on the ballot, because, you know, they've been gathering signatures all year on all six of these initiatives. When it was only the one initiative that looked like it would be on the ballot, then I think some of the advocates were less concerned about having an alternative with that initiative, because uh, then you could communicate about how it had been improve, improved by the legislature. Uh, I think now there's a lot of concern that because there will be a range of different issues, uh, and we have some polling suggesting that uh, the voters are likely to uphold several of the policies that we've passed, that maybe the strongest message to to resonate with the public is just vote no on on everything, right? That this is the, you know, this is a set of very wealthy people that are trying to undo progressive reforms that the legislature has put into effect over the last few years. And the cleanest, easiest to digest message is just no. Don't let wealthy people take over our government, right? So that also plays into what can we do, what should we do in terms of the reforms. Now, there are some, I mean, I, you know, I think the thing that's frustrating for me is I, I don't know if you could name a complicated, big change that we've made that we didn't need to come back and clean up for sometimes for years in a row, uh, making tweaks to make it work better for everybody. Two of the bills that I'm working on this next session are exactly that. They're cleanups of bills that I did over the last six years um, that need some changes and where we have some opportunities to make things better with the benefit of experience. So it, you know, that shouldn't be off the table, but we're, we're going to have to be, to protect the core of the policy, which I think uh, the majorities in both the House and the Senate are very committed, and certainly the governor were very committed to do, um, is going to require a, a kind of three-dimensional chess playing to figure out what's the best thing for us to do. If that, is that giving people refunds on their car tabs for a couple of years? That's what some people have proposed. Is it linking up the markets so that the prices of the carbon credits come down? Is it making some policy changes so that agriculture, for example, is excluded the way that it was intended in the original bill? I, you know, I think you'd find sympathy for all of those things in the legislature. But on the other hand, do we, in, do we endanger the whole thing? So stay tuned. Um, we're we're going to do our best, but uh, but it's we have a lot of uncertainties that we're trying to navigate at the same time. About 15 years ago, Seattle City Light had a very successful community solar energy program, which enabled individual homeowners to participate without requiring them to install solar panels on their roof. 
However, it wasn't continued for lack of state funds. I understand there's a proposed bill to promote more community solar projects throughout the state. Would you support that concept using Climate Commitment Act funds? Yes. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> we have done some policy making on um, community solar, and um, I've been um, tangentially involved in some of that, both as a budget writer, but as someone who um, is somewhat interested in this, because in my um, job outside the legislature, working for the Downtown Emergency Service Center, helped to develop um, affordable housing for people who are homeless and working to try to um, do that in the most energy efficient way and in a couple buildings in recent years um, really getting to net zero in our development strategy and um, so I've been intrigued by these um, the policy around how community solar can work um, so yes and I think we we have some champions in the legislature um, Senator Sharon Shoemake who used to serve with me in the house and now in the Senate has been a particular champion on this issue so um, there's lots of actually quite exciting ideas um, Jamie's comments notwithstanding about some of the um, maneuvering we may need to do related to the Climate Commitment Act um, if we're talking about just straight up appropriation investments in things, um, there are a number of fairly exciting proposals. The governor included some um, in his budget, but many legislators have been talking to groups across the state about how we can make the most strategic investments, not only to have the quickest and biggest impact in terms of um, climate action, but also um, how we can best support the communities who are most impacted today by climate change um, with the most negative um, um, the most negative effects on them. And community solar, therefore, sort of percolates to the top. Uh, there's also somebody over there, so if you want to, they've got to alternate. <laughs> My turn? Okay, Nicole, you talked about the rent stabilization. How about the real estate excise tax for affordable housing? Can you address that and how that's going to work? I'd almost think you were a plant with that question. <laughs> how did you say that? <laughs> well, well, thank you um, for asking that question. And um, I can't wait till Representative Chop gets here because he is um, particularly passionate about this, but I think we all are. Um, so the concept of the real estate transfer tax um, is one in which we would uh, lower taxes, the, um, the transfer tax that happens when a property is sold, we would lower taxes on the vast majority of um, Washingtonians on all properties valued under $3 million, and we would add um, progressive surcharge on those over three million dollars that would generate uh, the estimates I heard today about 250 million dollars a biennium or 125 million dollars a year and we would invest those dollars in um, building more housing for folks and um, really focused on building more affordable housing for people experiencing homelessness seniors people with disabilities um, farm workers in rural areas um, and um, it seems to make sense there's a good nexus there on a modest increase in in um, in revenue on the larger property owners and a decrease mostly on homeowners on small property owners um, so we are going to push for that and it, what, what, it would, what it would do would be cr to essentially create a foundation of steady funding um, for these programs. Because right now, um, we, the way we develop our capital budget is every two years, we, tr we sort of assess what we can do. So our housing trust fund, which is our biggest capital construction invest investment fund in affordable housing, has fluctuated 
significantly. So some years it's, well, one year it was zero. Some years it's been $20 million. Last year for this biennium, $400 million. And so if you want to create a steady pipeline of um, development of units, if you want to um, be able to tell communities, you can count on the state if you're doing planning, if you're doing your comprehensive planning and thinking about several years out and the and building that development capacity among the community-based organizations, local governments, et cetera, um, having this stable um, foundation of funding would be very, very important. So we're pushing for it. Am I up now? The uh, Seattle Times published an editorial a couple of weeks ago on uh, a school funding matter, and they pointed out, this is an editorial board opinion now, that a considerably more money is given to, in the distribution of school monies to districts. Considerably more money goes to districts that have uh, low poverty levels, that is, rich people, and considerably less money goes to districts where the poverty level is very high. And the numbers are not very clear, but what they do suggest is that something like $1,000 per pupil more is spent in what we'd call wealthier districts than in poorer districts. Wealthy and poor now having to do with parental income in those districts. And I just, it, it strikes me when I read that, I thought that's, there are a couple of qualities of that problem that jump out at me. Number one, damage to those kids in those districts that are they're not getting enough money is expectable. We know enough mountains of research show that money does matter. Smaller classes, better teaching, better materials, better facilities. There's no doubt about that at all. So there is expected damage here. And it's not just trivial damage. This can be very substantial and sometimes irreversible damage to these kids because failure to develop basic skills in early years follows the kids along through, as they go through school. Some of it can be made up but not all of it. So it's serious damage that's expectable. And the most shocking thing is that if you think about it, the children who are inf affected by this are totally, completely, wholly blameless. You know, you can adopt social policies, you can resist social policies to increase the wealth of their parents, and you hear the argument, well, if those parents had worked harder, or if they'd have made different life choices, or if they'd done this and that, they wouldn't be as poor as they were. You can't say any of that about the children. They are wholly blameless. So if you've got a situation in which you can expect serious damage to blameless children, it seems to me something needs to be done, and that's what the editorial called for. The, the executive branch can do something. The superintendent can adjust the formulas to help a little bit. The, the, the governor can help a little. But everybody knows about school finance that until the legislature owns the problem, nothing of any significant magnitude is going to happen. So my question to you is, is there anything cooking in this coming session to address problems of that kind? Sorry for the length. Yeah. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> no, no. Why, why no. don't you uh, I'll address that and then we'll go to Frank. So this is a super complicated problem that has its roots all the way back in the funding changes that were made in the early 70s. Part of the, what is at the core of this is that it's not as if Bellevue gets more per student than Seattle does or than Tacoma does. But what happens in the formulas is that there are adjustments for where teacher pay was historically there are adjustments for the cost of living in, uh, so there's regionalization for different schools. And then there's also an adjustment for an experience factor. And that was, I think, what the Times was really focused on, was that we paid more experienced, we paid districts that have a lot of experienced teachers more than we pay districts that have new and inexperienced teachers. And so there is the potential for compounding. Um, I think, you know, it's clear that if you, a lot, I would say almost everything that we did when we did the McCleary reforms starting in 2009 uh, was to focus on how we can try to achieve equity for kids who are coming up through the system. So we know, for example, that the 
key milestone is for third graders, by the time they finish third grade, to be able to read fluently and to be able to do their arithmetic. And, you know, some kids come to kindergarten doing those things pretty well, and others don't know their letters and numbers when they arrive, right? So we paid for all day kindergarten across the state. We paid for small class sizes, 17 kids, so that if you have kids with those deficits, the teachers have a chance to make those up by the time they get to third grade and give kids a much better chance to succeed through the system. Um, does that mean that we've resolved everything? Absolutely not. So um, I think the most significant thing that I'm aware of, Nicole and Frank may be hearing some other things, I, the um, teachers union and I think the governor included in his budget are talking about a significant increase in pay for uh, paraeducators. Um, and I think along 300 million bucks or something like that, that's, yeah, that, that's suggested in the budget, $3 an hour for them. Um, that would go a long way actually toward stabilizing the workforce for special education and helping districts pay the actual costs that uh, they're incurring in special education. So I think it would be a good step. That's, a, for a supplemental budget, that's a pretty big move. I don't think that there's any likelihood, honestly, that in a 60-day session we're going to be revisiting uh, education finance in, in any really significant way. But it is a topic that we will need to pay attention to as, for as long as any of us are around looking at it. Thank you. And now, <laughs> you know, Oh, Bill's going Bill's gonna to do an intro, so I, I won't <laughs> I have to do an It was funny. I was saying, I, so I was at Hamilton uh, International Middle School this morning and did the first three classes, and then Frank uh, was supposed to get there for 1 o'clock. He wasn't there. The teacher was getting anxious. <laughs> so, I, so I called him up. He said, I'm two minutes. I'm right out front. Two minutes, I'll be there. So I started talking about um, I, I, the kids were, you know, all gathered there in the library. So I started talking about Frank. And... Um, boy, by the time he got there, I got a little choked up because I what I <laughs> well what I what I just realized is what um, you know I look back on my 18 years his time stretches a little bit longer than that but I just realized how many how many things that we have gotten a chance to collaborate on and it, it's uh, uh, I am very proud to be represented by you so thank you for being here. There's no, there's no need, there's no need for further introduction. Here he is. I agree with everything Jamie said. Oh. <laughs> I, well, for those who didn't hear, I agree with everything Jamie said. Uh, uh, I guarantee you, you will be a better audience than eighth graders in international school and middle, <laughs> by far. Unless you ask questions about the color of my hair uh, and how it used to be when I was younger. <laughs> I said, you guys are a bunch of lucky people. You, you shouldn't just enjoy it while you got the hair. I mean, that was the level of intellectual discourse I had this afternoon. But, but thank you. I really enjoyed your uh, choking up, Jamie. I, I feel so uh, proud to be uh, a member with you, with uh, Nicole. I mean, you're very fortunate to have these two in the legislature representing them. I'll tell you, it's just amazing. Yeah, give my applause. Uh, so the other question I have for you is, how many of you protested things when you were younger and stopped traffic going across the University Bridge? I figured that. That's actually about what I thought you'd do. So uh, I didn't kill anybody coming over here. I didn't throw anybody off the bridge, but I got stuck on the University Bridge uh, protest. I don't know if, did you announce that? I have no idea. I was just protesting that protest, but <laughs> uh, who knows? I don't know. <laughs> so what am I supposed to talk about, Bill? Yourself. Oh, myself. Uh, what you're doing, what, what are you doing? In the legislature? What am I doing? Well, I, well, a lot of great stuff, actually. We we're uh, really uh, uh, pleased that we've just uh, completed our newsletter, and uh, you'll be seeing that in a couple weeks there, talking about what we did this last session but also what we hope to do this next session. Uh, in the short time since I'm late, I'll just pick one or two things. Uh, one is, uh, how many of you are aware of restrictive real estate covenants? 
Yeah, if you actually read the real estate covenants, uh, when you buy a house and you have it in the deed, many of those in uh, actually across the state had language in the real estate covenants on uh, homeowners uh, deed of trust or whatever. It said only white people can live here. I mean, it's in writing. It's just grotesque. I mean, now that all that was going on for decades, but it finally got ruled unconstitutional uh, at the end of the 1960s. The problem is it's been going on for decades, in fact, even more. So there's this huge generational wealth gap in our community where uh, basically uh, white folks uh, have more wealth uh, in terms of home ownership uh, than black folks. Uh, and it varies with other groups, but it was very clear in writing, only white people, which I think is very shameful. And the thing about it is the state of Washington was complicit in all this. Uh, we not only recorded those documents to put it in the file, uh, we also <laughs> defended that practice, saying that it was the right of people to discriminate like that. And we did that in front of the state Supreme Court. So in my opinion, we're liable. Therefore, the proposal to address that is the covenant home ownership account. And it's uh, more of a sort of a tort claim where harm was done, we need to do something to make up for that. Uh, as opposed to affirmative action, which is more about preferences and things like that. So guess what, with the help of uh, Nicole and Jamie, we passed that legislation. It's the first in the nation, and it's gonna invest about $2 billion over the next generation to help um, first-time home buyers who were directly affected, or their descendants, uh, to uh, give them significant down payment assistance to buy homes. And so it's a, a very historic thing, first in the nation by far. And it's, uh, it's, it's high, high time we do something about it. I mean, I've heard people point out that issue about the discrepancy and the discrimination and all the rest for years. And so uh, we did it. Now the question is, if you go out and try to buy a home now, can you find something you could afford of any race, no matter what you are? <laughs> or who you are, where you came from. I mean, the reality is now we have to implement it, which means we have to have affordable starter homes, uh, which is still difficult in Seattle, but we're working on it to identify specific sites and specific models of uh, you know, condos or uh, smaller starter homes, et cetera. So that's a big uh, step forward, and, and uh, the Democrats are very proud about that. Um, the Republicans said that they sort of liked it, but didn't like that we raised a little assessment. And the assessment <laughs> was actually on recording the documents. So going forward, we're gonna tack on a little money uh, to pay a fee to fund the down payment assistance. Um, so anyway, that's a, a great step forward. In other things though, I think that we were making real progress on this whole notion of having a home, which to me, Having a home is a fundamental human right, for God's sake. I mean, it's, it just tears me apart anytime I see any homeless people on the street suffering and dying. That is, should not be allowed. And um, so we are investing a lot uh, in various different ways to provide more housing for people in need, but also with this component of helping connect these very obvious ideas. I mean, sometimes doing the most obvious things are the most revolutionary things. I mean, imagine uh, connecting the notion of housing with health care. And uh, we're doing that. We passed Apple Health and Homes, which is basically making a connection with this simple premise of a, essentially a, pres a prescription for a home. Now, I, I, should I ask them how many of them have per prescriptions? I don't know. I think they're probably 100%. <laughs> just guessing. I don't know. I'm on prescriptions myself. What the hell? Uh, but uh, the notion is that if you are chronically homeless and have a major medical condition like mental illness, substance use disorder, or a major physical disability, then you shall have a home as part of your medical treatment. Now, we've done that. Oh, go ahead. Applaud. <laughs> I wasn't sure you were going to applaud it for me being so damn late, so I'm sorry about that. But uh, the point is, is that we have to do what's obvious. They have a medical condition. Everybody nowadays says, oh, of course we understand mental illness. Uh, now we're a little bit more in terms of substance use disorder. Well, what are we going to do about it? Those folks are literally suffering and dying on the street. 
Now, Nicole, with her uh, agency and other agencies similar to that, are doing a lot already, but we got to take it to the next level. And what's great about it, have you ever heard of Medicaid? Okay, we finally convinced Medicaid to provide at least six months of federal money for the housing. Yeah, yeah, so, um, but that's not all. We want to go make it more permanent for when, how long you need it. At any rate, I could go on, how many hours, Bill? Uh, I can go on quite, I have many other things to talk about, but I'll leave it to those two things. We have to take what's obvious in society in the case of racism and doing something about it, in the case of human need, and then also doing something about it. Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, we're supposed to end at five, but I'm hoping that we can uh, go a little, little further. There is going to, there is a, an event outside that begins, actually it's begun already, uh, a Hanukkah uh, celebration. And so after five, there will be a klezmer band, which will, uh, might, I hope not drown us out, but I'm, uh, but uh, also I promised Sam to please, uh, it, when you do leave, uh, leave quietly uh, because that is going on over there. Now, that having been said, why don't we ask some more questions? One over here. Hi, Tom Spiro here. Uh, so thank all three of you for the really hard work that you've done. We really appreciate all these good things. Uh, back to the environment for a moment. Um, I'm very interested in the in the RAP Act, which didn't quite make it. Uh, this is the uh, notion that <coughs> makers of materials, particularly packaging, should be responsible for the for their disposal, because uh, at the moment we're drowning in the trash that's produced. The recycling programs as brave as they are, don't, are really inadequate for, for this uh, uh, job, and many uh, municipalities are actually not recycling anymore because of the expense. So I'm wondering what the prospects are for, for getting the RAP Act passed. Uh, we'll start uh, the RAP Act. Yes, I'm supporting that. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about it. One question I have for you, have you ever been to Fremont? All right. Remember the Fremont Recycling Station number one? Uh, how many of you were on the curb collection routes that Armand Napoleon Stepanian created when he was running the Fremont Recycling Station? Anybody here? Oh, that's surprising because uh, we plotted to build support for recycling at that point. Um, and uh, so we uh, literally created 29 home uh, curbside uh, collection routes and we made sure that Every single council member on the Seattle City Council was one of those things. It's to sort of shame them into recycling. So that was then. Now we have a different situation where we've done quite a bit to advance recycling for obvious reasons, for God's sake. It's, uh, but this RAP Act is intended to take it a step further. The concern about the RAP Act is people's concern about it driving up the cost for average working folks who have to put another dime or whatever on the deposit. I'm not sure about the latest proposal if that's still the case because this is from last session. But I think people are pulling it together, answering the questions, responding oh, to legitimate concerns, and then I think the chance of it passing is uh, uh, pretty good. I think that the uh, th those two ideas have now been separated into two different bills. And the, the RAP Act is becoming the RE-RAP Act um, with some extended producer responsibility. And then there will separately be a bottle deposit bill. Um, it, it's interesting. We just got in our inboxes today uh, a report about the success of recycling efforts around the country in different states and what regulatory structures uh, were conducive to the highest levels of recycling. Uh, and that report suggested that a, having a bottle bill is, is actually pretty important to, um, to the success of uh, high participation in recycling. I'm not sure that we'll have the votes for that this year, but I think there's a good prospect for the remaining pieces of the bill to, to move forward. Hello. Um, my question is in regards to domestic violence and that I think that it is that it's 
in that I think that it's being falsified uh, often, and it seems like which parent makes it down to the police station first is the one that's right. And for the other parent, that they have to that they have to dig their way out of the accusation when there's not been any proof and why is it that a parent is being separated from his child uh, and there's never been any evidence. I got, I got nominated for this one. Um, so look, I think we, we know some things from, our, from the research that we have. Uh, one of those things is that domestic violence is often a precursor to much worse violence. Um, it's one of the reasons that we now take away firearms from people who are convicted of even misdemeanor domestic violence uh, because there is such a strong association uh, with uh, later intimate partner violence uh, and, you know, strangulation and murder. Um, what that means, because the process isn't, the process isn't complete, is that sometimes we are erring on the side of separating people and disturbing relationships between parents and children. It can happen, uh, it can happen with uh, mothers, not only with fathers. Um, but there, you know, there is that, uh, there is that risk. I think we are, our public policy has generally been to try to follow the science and the data and to do our best to keep people safe. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have to recognize that there are some, that there are collateral consequences uh, from that policy, but I think, um, the evidence that I've seen suggests that in, in the aggregate that keeps more people safe uh, than pursuing the other policy. Well, if there is no proof, why aren't they being kept in touch with their children? There's never been any proof. So the question is, if there's never any proof, why aren't people allowed to reconnect with their children? They are. If there's never any proof, I mean, so this, we're talking about, um, you know, so we had a colleague who is an elected official uh, who was accused of domestic violence. He was put in jail uh, mandatorily overnight while the investigation happened. As it turns out, it, it was his uh, wife who had, who um, suffers from alcohol use disorder and had initiated the violence. You know, so it was a very rough night for him. It was a rough few days until the truth of that got ferreted out. And then after that, um, he's back in custody of his kids and she's in treatment. Um, but in the meantime, the presumption is trying to make sure that uh, the partners and the kids are safe. So, um, you know, this is, this is often the case with the legal system. It, it is kind of the nature of what do we have to do in the meantime uh, to make sure that, that there's no more damage done. Right. <clears throat> I want briefly to go back to the comment that Frank made. I don't know how many of you know, other people in the room perhaps, H. Jack Geiger, do you know that name? He was one of the founders of the Physicians for Human Rights. In the 60s, he wrote prescriptions. As a doctor, he said, what you need is a house. And it was in Boston. He got in a lot of trouble for that. Nobody paid attention. I think this is the first time I've heard where people are actually putting their our money where our mouth is. I think that's a spectacular breakthrough. Now, um, I also want to this is not directly about any specific work you're doing, but more generally, my worry about this country being split in half, that um, Washington is predictably democratic. Most states are predictably one or the other. 
I think that's more the problem than the solution. We're, we are becoming a nation divided. And I wondered if there's anything, uh, and you have more access to people throughout the state being in the, in the legislature than we do. Is there any way in which your work speaks to that issue in a way that's helpful in moving us forward as a nation? There's a delay here. Um, yeah, happy to, thank you, Andy. Uh, I'm happy to take that one. So, you know, I haven't kept super careful. I probably introduced now around 120 bills over the course of 18 years. I th you can definitely count on your fingers the number that don't have a Republican co-sponsor. Um, and I think that is a super important discipline for me always to try to find common ground with people that I'm working with. So um, I'll tell you right now, I'm, I'll just, let me tell you the story of one, um, one bill that I'm working on. The, the only one that I'm planning to pre-file that I have not yet dropped. Um, so you may have seen a story in the Times uh, last June or so about uh, a woman who has a, she's a tenant, she has a, some national management company that manages her, um, manages her apartment and owns, I think, the apartment that she lives in. And they had some kind of global system uh, for setting the rents that has uh, escalated rents really quickly. And there was an attempt to put together a class action lawsuit against the, um, this company, the landlord, and she could not participate because in the fine print of her lease was a waiver of any right ever to participate in a class action against her landlord. And I read that and I just thought, well, man, that is just crazy. That there's no way that people should, <laughs> should be limited in the remedies that they have um, when they're appropriate. I, kind of on a separate note, uh, Nicole and Frank and I have all gotten some, have you ever heard of, have gotten messages from some people about a new issue that has apparently arisen with the, these fancy downtown towers of condos called valet garbage? Have you ever heard of this? Valet garbage. So in the valet garbage world, what happens is that the landlord now forces you to use a service to carry your sack of garbage from your front door down to the garbage chute at the end of the hall. And then they charge you two, three, four hundred dollars a month for the privilege of having somebody carry your garbage to the end of the hall. And, and it's, yeah, how much do they get paid? And it's not optional, right? You can't opt out of this fee that just gets tacked on. So anyway, I, I got kind of exercised about, uh, about these things and started putting together a bill uh, about that, as we dug into it, and I talked to some of the um, talked to some of the tenant advocates, they raised some other issues. You know, one of the things that we were worried about is arbitrate on the class action thing is arbitration. Um, so, the Federal Arbitration Act actually prohibits people from excluding arbitration as a dispute resolution alternative. But wow, that's tough for tenants too because. Uh, it's most often the case with arbitration that you have to pay half the fee up front for the arbitration. And if you're, if you're in a dispute with your landlord about whether they've done something right or the rent, you know, with the rent, like, really, are you going to come up with $1,250 to pay half of the arbitrator's fee before we start? So anyway, I started putting together this bill and talked to tenant advocates about that. And you know, I guess in one world, where in a world where you have Democrats in control of both houses and a Democratic governor, that could be the end of the story. But then I reached out to my friends at the Landlord Association, starting with the Washington Multifamily Housing Association, which are the big landlords, and said, um, you know, these are pretty egregious practices. Do you really want to be defending that? Don't you think we could come to some agreement about that? And miracle of miracles, they agreed. And so we're having a meeting tomorrow to figure out exactly what the language is. With Armed with that, I went to a Republican from the 25th District, uh, Senator Chris Gildon, 
uh, and asked him if he would be willing to be the second sponsor on the bill. And, you know, and by the way, I had to take out one piece uh, of the what had been suggested by the tenant advocates originally, but, you know, that's that's the legislative process, right? And I think the result is, from all of that, that we're going to have a tenant bill. We often, you know, the landlord-tenant issues are some of the most divisive things that we have in the legislature, where we're going to have broad bipartisan support, and it's going to be able to go into law and start helping people. And, you know, I, I guess I raise that just to say that um, the stories you hear about in the papers and on TV are often about the most divisive uh, issues, but last year we passed 485 bills, and probably 460 of them had bipartisan support, right? We actually, one of the things that I think we all work hard to do is to talk with our colleagues, and we can't always agree. I mean, I give up on gun stuff. I, I can never get any Republicans to help on any gun responsibility or gun violence prevention issue, or mostly not. Um, but on most of the issues that are in front of us, there is common ground to be found if you just have the will to do that. And, um, and so I, I think we do. And uh, that's one of the reasons why our legislature uh, works well. Yeah. Can I just add to that? Um, well, this is an example of the brilliance of Jamie Peterson. He not only thinks this stuff through, but reaches out to the other side. I mean, just spectacular. I mean, just uh, amazing. I on the other hand realize that legislators don't get paid much, so I'm willing to take your garbage down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> uh, getting on this subject, though, uh, we'll get. Just give me a sec. Uh, when I was speaker for 20-some years, I basically uh, had a theme of working together for one in Washington. So we reached out all across the state to figure out what the rest of the state really needed, whether it be uh, agricultural issues or investments in local community colleges or a, a medical center over at the WSU uh, campus uh, uh, in Spokane to proactively bridge this uh, supposed divide. So that at the end, at least they didn't hate us uh, whereas in other states, they are just at war with each other. The, the spite and the pettiness is just, <laughs> I can't believe it. That's not good politics for Democrats. Yes, we're in the majority right now, and I think we will be for many years, but we can't overplay that hand. We have to reach out to people who, across the state because they're taking care of business in their own communities and they need to be involved. So that helps a lot as well to have the right theme uh, to emphasize those kinds of things that we can agree to. I, I had a question on gun control. Maybe Jamie has already answered it. But this, this seems to be a tremendous availability of weapons still on the street. Is there any action in the legislature to try to reduce the availability of this, these weapons? I, I guess the first thing is, um, if you're in a hole, stop digging, which is why we banned the sale of uh, high capacity magazines and assault, and that was in 2022, and in 2023, we banned the sale of assault weapons. Um, you know, we have a, we have a huge challenge that we're facing, both because in our state constitution, you know, regardless of what you think about the Second Amendment, our state constitution, Article 1, Section 24, guarantees the individual right to keep and bear arms. And, um, you know, we've got now a really activist U.S. Supreme Court that is laying waste to a lot of work that uh, folks have done to try to prevent gun violence across the country. There's a terrifying case that they have in front of them right now about a domestic violence perpetrator uh, who's claiming that the Second Amendment means that he should not have his guns taken away from him. And, um, you know, I think from based on the oral argument, it's likely that they're going to find some way of upholding that. But literally, the, the Bruin decision from uh, Clarence Thomas said that if it wasn't the law in 1789 when the Second Amendment was adopted, that there's no historical precedent, you can't do the law now. No sort of balancing test or whatever, you know. So we are, on the one hand, I think, 
trying to be aggressive about protecting communities from gun violence, and on the other hand, living in fear that something that we pass can wind up being the basis for the US Supreme Court unwinding all sorts of other good things that we've tried to do. So that's part of, that's part of the reality for the world. That said, I'll just tell you there are two significant bills that are um, in process right now in terms of gun violence prevention. One is a bill uh, that will require a permit to purchase, and that will involve a mandatory waiting period before people can actually uh, take a firearm home. Uh, so that's a, that would be a positive change. The second um, is a bill that is a follow-up on a liability bill that I did this last year, and it's a, um, or a gun retailer code of conduct. So it would impose a requirement of heightened security, gun safes, you know, how the retailers store things, training for their employees to make sure that they know how, what the law is about who can purchase firearms and how to follow it. Um, all of, and then if you fail to do those things, then potentially you're putting yourself at, at risk uh, for lawsuits. Uh, we are also gonna require insur a certain amount of insurance coverage for those businesses. And the carriers, I think, will be a very, infor uh, very important enforcement mechanism because they're gonna be in there, if they're gonna uh, put an insurance policy on a business, they're gonna be making sure that the business has good controls in place. So, you know, I think we, of necessity, are most focused on how we can make sure that law-abiding, responsible people can still enjoy the constitutional right that they have, but making sure that we take away any possibility that folks who are going to use guns for any uh, ill purpose uh, do not have access to them. Thank you. We have time for one more, so. Uh, well, perhaps it's appropriate because I want to ask a question that uh, is not related to the legislature, and that is that uh, obviously there's a lot of support for Biden in at Horizon House, and what I would like to ask the elected officials, um, what do you recommend that we do beyond contributing money to the campaign? <laughs> vote? No. Obviously, everyone here is going to vote. Um, I think, um, yes, we are very concerned about what's happening at the top of the ticket, right, for our, for our 2024 presidential election. Um, I think, um, you know, chances are pretty good that uh, if that President Biden's gonna succeed here in Washington State. I think it's important to talk with folks who you know in other states um, about the importance of voting. And I think um, to also look at these other races that are gonna be on the ballot. Uh, a lot of the, um, you know, we here in Washington State uh, weathered some not great policy at the federal level. And I would say um, Senator Peterson just talked about the United States Supreme Court. I think um, that is a threat to us all. But Washington State has really been the backstop on some of these, um, I would say, bad decisions coming out of the courts. So like overturning Roe v. Wade is bad for us across the country. Um, but here in Washington State, the fact that we have um, legislators and a governor at the state level um, who not only um, held the line on reproductive health um, access, but added protections in, in the wake of um, the Supreme Court decision is, is essential. So we're very concerned about what's happening um, at the federal level but it is, I think, as important or in some ways more important for us as Washingtonians to be engaged in these state-level races as well. So um, you already heard about the initiatives. So when you get that message to vote no on all of them, <laughs> make sure you talk with folks because it is really, it's not, um, 
These are not inconsequential things. This is really an unwinding of um, the investments and the protections that we have put in place uh, for Washingtonians. The capital gains tax um, funds early learning and K-12 education. It brings us closer to the vision of universal um, pre-K in our state. And w if it goes away, um, we are moving significantly backwards. The, the conversations about equitable um, funding for our um, public schools, we will be set back significantly. And so um, there is that. The Walk Cares Long-Term Care um, Program, if that gets repealed, Washington State is the first in the nation. This is essentially the biggest expansion of Social Security at the state level to make sure that working people today um, have the um, hope of having their long-term care needs met um, when they need it. And to see that potentially um, unwound um, is a huge step backwards. Climate Commitment Act, it is people, oh, not just here in Washington State, across the country they say it is the best in the nation policy for reducing carbon in the environment um, and that could be unwound um, all next November. So yes, we often, when it's a presidential election year, we get very focused on the drama of those, you know, that CNN and, and all the news channels um, play it incessantly, continually, but we need to be focused on some of the stuff closer to home as well. So just wanna focus us on that. That, but I don't wanna do it on videotape. With that, with that said, uh, are there anything else that either the three of you would like to add? <laughs> you know, I, I guess let us just close by saying thank you to all of you. It, it is such a privilege to represent this district. This district is the most highly educated, the most <laughs> left-leaning uh, <laughs> district in the in the entire state. You know, it, it's. I think there are a lot of our colleagues who sweat about voting the right way and have to worry about when they vote for the Climate Commitment Act or they vote for the long uh, Walk Cares program, the long-term care program, or vote for the capital gains tax. Gosh, is, it, is this gonna cost me my next election? Is this gonna be the centerpiece of a mailer? For the entire time that I have been in the legislature, I feel confident that if, when I decide what I think the right thing is for my constituents and for the state, that I can vote that way. I don't have to think any further about it. It's just a one question deal. And it is a giant privilege to have constituents like you who are engaged and aligned with us. Um, so I just wanna say thank you. Thank you all for being here today. It, we, we love this work because of the people that we represent. And so it's a great privilege. Thank you. Thank you. With that, with that said, and I just I do want to point out the, the the two folks over there wanting to sign up you for further engagement in Olympia as well as learning more about the the uh, uh, League of Women Voters, and also remember that go quietly uh, because there's a there is a, a, a celebration going on out there, and hopefully that you we will see many of you at the. Uh, at the buffet. Thank you very much. <laughs>